Well, hi everybody. Welcome to Small Talk. I'm with Peter Lang, and we are at the E Young Restaurant. Um, so welcome back to the show because you've been on here before. Mm-hmm. Now this coming here was your idea. Yeah. <laughs> Why was that? Well, I saw you were having lunch one day. Was I think it was your sister or something, and I just thought it was a fun video because you guys just were having some casual banter, <laughs> but in a nice busy environment like this. Right. It gives us the restaurant a little bit of promotion too. I've never been here before. And like I really like it. I think I told you before we started recording. I really like it. You know, uh, mm-hmm. the owner. The, I think he's the owner. The young man over there. Mm-hmm. He's really really sweet man. Mm-hmm. That's the word to use. But anyway, I want to talk about you were the current president of the Metis uh, Society. Yeah. Right? Chilliwack, uh, yeah. Chilliwack Society. Now, this is not the first time you've been the president, is it? No, I've been president for a couple of the terms now. And um, we actually have our AGM this weekend, but it's a non-voting AGM, so no election to be had. But still, we get everybody together. We kind of do a State of the Union uh, sort of address, and um, we bring in some guest speakers. Mm-hmm. We have uh, sandwiches, you know, catered in and stuff, and yeah. uh, it's a nice afternoon. And and we do have some empty spots as directors, so we're hoping to recruit one or two directors uh, to fill out our board because a lot of us want to move on. Like sure. I definitely want to move on next year. So this time next year, I do not plan on being a president. I'll be doing something else. I may not even be living here anymore. So was that right? Are you considering yeah. moving? Yeah. Yeah, I want to get back to the island, and I've got some opportunities over there, and um, my sister's over there and my parents and they're getting up in age and I just like the pace over there so much nicer. I love Chilliwack too but the pace over on the mainland is so much faster than it is on the island. The instant I get to the island my anxiety level goes right down. So I need to get back there. Right. It's, it's kind of interesting you know because I come from, I was, I was born in a small town in northern New Brunswick mm-hmm. and when we go back to visit it's the same thing it's a totally different pace. Well, yeah. Right? I love New Brunswick too. Do you? Yeah I've been to Fredericton and Moncton twice. Actually three times to Moncton. But Fredericton, I really liked because they had a really beautiful museum there next to the hotel. I don't think I've ever been there. <laughs> it's called the Lord Beaverbrook Museum. Oh. And they actually had some Salvador Dollies in there. Wow. Yeah, which is pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, and I uh, discovered some new Canadian painters. Attila Lukacs. You know, if you want to look him up, he's a Canadian painter. Right. Uh, he had some of his works in there. It was pretty, pretty nice stuff. Cool. But I just always have a soft spot for the Maritimes because the people are so friendly there. So, again, it's different. Different, right? You know, it's so, so interesting because I lived there, I lived in Montreal, I lived in Ontario, and I lived out here. Um, I think Ontario was the most um, not so laid back area of mm. all of the provinces that I've lived in. Oh, yeah. You know, that even, was even, even less laid back than Quebec. Oh, listen, I, I grew up there for fun Thomas eight years old. So yeah. we, it was a fun place. It was you could for young people where I grew up at uh, the town in De Saint Laurent, yeah. just in West Island and Montreal. There's always some place to go dancing, the preps everywhere, there's oh, yeah. no, so it was really, really good in that sense, and people in Quebec know how to party. Oh yeah, they do that, yeah. <laughs> Quebec City, I've been to a couple times, Chicoutimi, right. been there, that's a true French town. That's a true, yeah. Yeah, well I get along with both the French and the English, so I didn't have, ne- yeah. you know, I never had a problem there. Montreal is a pretty good spot for that. A lot of my family speak French, you know, mm-hmm. so like we have our French family and our English family and mm-hmm. we all mix. Have you ever right? met a Frank Ontarian? <laughs> no. Yeah, I met a couple. <laughs> they live like usually uh, somewhere around Ottawa. Right. Oh, well, to, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, but they, they grow up French, but they live in Ontario. Right. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. though, right? Especially if they work for the government or anything like that. Yeah, that's probably why I met them, <laughs> working for the government. <laughs> so let's, now let's talk about your, your presidency. First of yeah. all, uh, oh, here was, here's our tea and coffee. Nice. Thank you so much. We're, we're taping an interview at your restaurant. Oh, that's okay. We're promoting it. <laughs> People <laughs> will <coffee>. know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I said I saw her doing an interview here a while ago, and I said, I haven't been there for lunch. Let's go there for lunch. <laughs> Do so. you still need a little tour, though, or are you uh, ready? I think we know what we want. So I'm going to get a, a, the chicken stir yeah. fry, please. Of course, certainly, like last time, right? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And then I'm going to have that ginger beef on ginger rice. Beef yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. I'm allergic to ginger. Are you? And nutmeg and cinnamon and oh. all those fun things. Um, so... Presidency. How, yeah, how many how many Métis are there in Chilliwack? Uh, well, in our area, as we cover Chilliwack, um, Hope, Agassiz, up to Boston Bar, pretty much. 
and we have over 900, almost a thousand now. Is that right, eh? Card carrying citizens. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, so we have a lot of self declared that don't necessarily have their card yet, or they're mistaken. They think they're Metis, but they're actually not. They're mm. maybe just part Indigenous, part First Nation. Uh, but we, we don't uh, discriminate. We don't say you have to have your card to yeah. be part of our community. We, we say you're, everybody's welcome, even non Indigenous people, we welcome to our events. Um, because we have like spouses of Métis people that aren't Indigenous, mm-hmm. so they come to our events. And likewise, when we have somebody who's self-declared but doesn't have their card, and we try to help them get their card. And sometimes through the process of doing that, they learn, oh, I'm not really Métis. Ah. I'm part, I don't know, Algonquin or something. You right. know? And yeah. we encourage people to embrace that, you know? Yeah, that's so cool, yeah. actually. Yeah. I think that's great. Like, I would just think if somebody said to me, oh, Nancy, you're Italian. And I said, no, according to my DNA, I'm from the Iberian Peninsula, mm-hmm. my ancestors. So yeah. Spain and Portugal and, you know, because some people think I'm um, indigenous. Yeah. And I think it's just the coloring. Yeah, exactly. Right? I get the opposite because I'm so white. <laughs> <laughs> so, people are like, no, you're not. So, but it's uh, it's interesting, especially uh, with Métis and, and mixed. A lot of First Nations are mixed as well. Um, I know, uh, and they're uh, full-on part of their community. They may or may not have a status card, but they're accepted by their, their nation. Um, so similar to us. And my background is Métis is uh, part Irish, cunning Okay. They're all cutting hats. Okay. Came from Ireland mm. and Orkney Islands or something like that, and then uh, married First Nations, right? Right. And, uh, so that's how the nation was birthed. It was the birth of our nation. We're way uh, younger than most First Nations. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're, we predate Canada, but we don't predate First Nations. Okay. Right. Yeah. You know, when it comes to the card, that's a government thing, right? I mean, it's not. Yeah. Well, not a. No. With with First Nations, yes, because it's Indian, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's the government of Canada issuing a status card based on things like blood quantum and the, the Racist Indian Act. But with Métis, we were left out of the Indian Act. They considered us part of uh, colonized because our fathers were all from Europe, right? But we never really fit into either world. We were sort of, uh, we were called half-breeds. Mm, right. So if you looked darker, you were treated as if you were First Nations. If you looked sort of middle of the road, they would call you half-breed. And uh, you didn't really feel like you fit in each either world sometimes. Sure, yeah. Most of the time, First Nations have been very open and embracing, especially in the prairies. If they know that you're part Cree, like I'm Cree, my great grandmother uh, was Cree. Uh, Cree on one side and Métis on the other. So I get treated once I they know that that's who I am they go that I get treated like I'm one of them but uh, many didn't feel like they fit in either world and it was tough right so I feel like I have a foot in both worlds I recognize that I walked through the world with privilege because of my skin color and I was lucky enough to grow up in a relatively stable middle classish home and I didn't have a lot of the things that a lot of Métis families would have if they were poor. But that's only because my mom and my dad were very committed and, and uh, started off quite poor. But by the time I was in high school and graduating, they were solid middle class. Right? So, so I was lucky, but uh, a lot of uh, Métis families have very similar stories to First Nations where there's alcoholism and abuse and residential school and uh, different generations of that. And that's in my family too but just not my direct family. my parents didn't drink you know so yeah. there was no alcohol or that type of fighting going on in the home or any of that type of stuff but I, my extended family that is there right so, yeah. so at your meetings like what what type of topics would you be discussing oh money we talk about spending money like spending we, money yeah like promoting our mandate is to basically promote Métis culture to Métis people. We're not here to assert any land-based rights or hunting mm-hmm. rights or things like that. Uh, the Métis homeland does extend into BC, up into Kelly Lake, up north. Uh, so there is part of the traditional homeland is in this province. Um, but specifically down here, any Métis that came through here it was transitory. It was on their way to trade at Fort Langley or, or uh, down the Columbia River into the U.S. Right. So they were might have set up temporary little villages, 
Yeah, yeah. But it was temporary. It wasn't like they were putting roots down and having families. Their families were back in the Red River or, um, or um, Isla La Crosse in Saskatchewan or Cumberland House and those historic Métis communities, Kelly Lake. Right. You know, okay. so, um, so we don't, and this is a, kind of a contention with a lot of Métis people because there are Métis people out there that try to assert land-based rights down here and I don't agree with that. No. And most of us don't. Okay. The vast majority of the Métis were like, no, this is First Nations unceded territory. Oh, yeah, right. We don't have a right to do anything here on the land without their okay. Yeah. You know, whether it's fishing, hunting, um, you know, any of those type of things. So, so our meetings are more around promoting jigging, the language, the Chick language, helping people reconnect and learn that, ensuring the schools have good representation. And, um, hello. Oh, is that does that come with mine? Yeah. <laughs> does that come with my? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Or maybe it comes with yours. I don't no, know. It doesn't come with mine. I've never had it, so it can't be. Mm. All right, well, I'll you know. You'll find out. <laughs> yeah, somebody else will. Hey, man, that's my suit. <laughs> you stole my suit, man. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so that's our mandate is to do that. And we also want to help support our Métis families that might need support. So if we get, like, money for food security, we will help um, families that are in need uh, with groceries and things like that by giving them same on cards. We ran that program for two or three years, and the money dried up after uh, the pandemic was done. And um, But if we ever see that money come back, that's one thing we'll do again. So where does that money come from? Well, it comes from Métis Nation. In BC, which comes from the federal government okay. through the Métis National Council, then to Métis Nation BC. So, right. Well, there must be a lot. I'm thinking because a lot of people are struggling for groceries right now. Oh yeah, right? With inflation and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. So if you're in that really low income, mm -hmm. fifty bucks or seventy. Actually, we were doing seventy-five for a single elder right? per month. And 150 for a couple or family. Yeah. Yeah. And that it didn't mend it yet. It might help, but I'm just thinking, you know, it's not easy for, for anybody um, who's below the, you know, mm -hmm. your income is not very high, right? No. And you have to make a choice. That's if, right. Especially if you have to uh, have medication. Well, and then, as you know, a lot of the cheapest food you can buy in a store is not healthy. No, I know. Exactly. So then you, your body starts to break down and yeah. get malnourished and whatnot. So, I mean, fruits and vegetables are expensive. They so, sure are. So we'll try and help out. That's why we did the farmer's market last yeah. year. We didn't do it this year because we didn't get the grant. But uh, and I needed somebody to run it because I didn't have the time to run it. But we did the farmer's market coupon. So that coupled with the save-on cards mm -hmm. really helped a lot of families out. Uh, and it was First Nations and MBT that we supported and non Métis, like non Indigenous. We had some that were part of the um, Bowls of Hope program right, right. that they couldn't necessarily support, so they would direct them over to us. Oh, okay, because I know that the, the free store, uh, the Chilliwack free store, helps out many, many, many families. I think mm -hmm. there's like 500 families. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, Zishan's um, Streams Canada also. Uh, mm -hmm. well, I think Streams Canada helps mostly seniors. Mm -hmm. But they're not the only ones struggling for food. There's young families with you know, yeah. little children. And, yeah. Right. You're just around the corner here, you go stand outside that school, and you'll see. You know, this is probably the poorest neighborhood in, in Chilliwack, right? Yeah, absolutely. So people struggle. Yeah, I kind of wonder. I don't know if this is controversial, but why they're trying to build up the five corner in that area with these fancy restaurants when around the corner, mm -hmm. you know, you have struggling families that just needs a little. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know what the word is, but um, it's ridiculous to me anyway. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you need oh, everything. Thank you. You're welcome. You need it all, right? You need it all, exactly. One one doesn't ex shouldn't exclude the other. Yep. Right? This place is a pretty uh, reasonable. Yes. You know? Yes. Like, I don't go out to restaurants often. With my sister, we try to get together once a month. Yeah. But we haven't done it lately because my sister Marie hasn't been feeling good. She's got, she has bronchitis. Oh, okay. So it's all your fault. Marie, it's all your fault. Yeah. Does <laughs> oh, she live locally? She lives, yeah. She lives up in, she lives in uh, Sardis. Mm. My sister Kitty lives right across. 
from other parties, um, on Young. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to the Uptown Grill? That, that's an 1881, and it's pretty affordable. Uh, the prices are pretty good. Mm -hmm. They've done a good job of just trying to keep it really basic, and you get a lot of food for the. It's always way too much for me, man. Well, this is what you want. You know, want the leftovers, you know? Yeah. I like leftovers. I have no problem with that. Right? Yeah. I'll take it home and eat it either the same day or the next day. Yeah, as a single person, you can kind of uh, sometimes find places that are reasonable like that mm -hmm. that are actually probably cheaper than buying groceries because I find if I buy a loaf of bread and it's just for me, mm -hmm. it goes bad before I can use it all. I put it in the freezer, but I also get, end up with all these little loaves in the freezer all the time. <laughs> so, same with bananas. I'll bring bananas and not get through them all, so I throw them in the freezer and then all of a sudden I've got to make a bunch of banana bread. <laughs> so. You have to do whatever you can do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one other thing we're doing though with the Métis is we're looking at uh, an apartment building in, in Sardis. It's about seven million dollars, but it's got thirty-six units in it. Mm -hmm. And um, so we can go through the Economic Development Corporation, the Métis one, for the province and possibly get money from them to help us buy that place, like put a sizable down payment, a couple million or something, and then rent it out uh, and make it like one that would be subsidized. There's two buildings there, 18 units in each building. Okay. One would be uh, subsidized for like seniors and young families or couples that are just starting out. Right. And then the other one would be market, market rate or whatever. Oh, that'd be cool. So, yeah. So we like to do things like that. It hasn't come to fruition yet. Um, not sure if it will, but we try to do things like that. And we, you know, depends on how much money. The, the problem is, is the colonial government always controls the purse strings, right? Absolutely. So you don't get the money, you can't do the work. Mm -hmm. As president, what is your job? What is your role? Well, you know what? Like, it, it's probably the easiest role in that way. I mean, you chair the meetings monthly. You sometimes get asked to go and speak at certain things. So that's not easy, but um, my team, my board, do a lot of work. It uh, doesn't go unrecognized by the rest of us on the board, but sometimes people don't realize how much work they do. We're in the process of doing some renovations at Métis House right now. We just uh, we got two bathrooms now instead of one. We used to only have one, which was a problem when you have bigger events. Um, we got new windows put in there. We rent off a of stall by the way we don't own that building but we um, we got a grant and we asked them we could do some upgrading of the building and they agreed so because um, it helps them in the long run anyway yeah right? totally and uh, we reorganized our cellar um, lots of really good things that are going on so 55,000 I think that we're spending on renovating we made the path safer to the front yard so it's uh, nice even gravel now so we have an outdoor event, people that come there have a nice, safe walking path. We fixed our wheelchair ramp, so it's not quite so steep. Uh, so uh, we have elders or seniors that have walkers or wheelchairs. They can um, get up the ramp easier. Right. And we also uh, made sure one of our bathrooms is still wheelchair accessible. So on average, how many people would show up at a meeting? Oh, um, we have a board of about seven right now. We can have as many as nine. We have a youth rep, a uh, women's rep, secretary, vice president, which is one person filling both of those roles right now, um, and um, some directors as well. Okay. Yeah. And an elder, Mary, Mary Daniels. Oh, all right. She's Harry Daniels' auntie. So, oh, right on. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's Harry Daniels auntie. Right. And he was a famous Métis, and there's a court case called the Daniels decision. And that was, was her nephew. Remind me, about what was that about? That was really about um, Métis rights. Because mm. we were sort of left to sort of, you know, because we weren't covered under the Indian Act, for one thing. So we were in Section 35 of the Constitution, but we would never, ever get any recognition from the federal government, even though we're in Section 35. Right. Yeah. Anyway, they, uh, 
Daniel's decision helped basically said that we are the fiduciary responsibility of the federal government. So that's why we're starting to see the money flow. And this is why you start to see the dirty politics. Yeah, yeah. As soon as there's money involved, you get dirty politics. That's why I'm wearing my Louis Real $100. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, anytime there's money involved, you start to get dirtiness happening. And that, that's the sad part. Harry passed on, I think in the early 2000s, he's on one of the stamps. Okay. One of the Canada stamps. But he was always a bit of a hero of mine, just because of the way he spoke. He was very direct and very passionate about things. And he didn't uh, BS. And I don't like people who BS. Yeah. I like to I like to straight goods. Yeah, me too, yeah. And it rubs people the wrong way sometimes, but I don't give a crap. They'll get over it. You know where I stand with you. Yeah. They'll get over it or they won't. It's yeah. as simple as that. And I'm not a liar. I'm not going to lie. Good. So. Good. Got me a couple at work sometimes. <laughs> because sometimes they want you to lie at work. And I won't do it. That's not right, is it? No, it's not right. I mean, we shouldn't be ever be asked to lie, you know? Well, they wouldn't look at it that way. They would say it's just the way I see it. But, you know, one time I did an investigation because I do labor relations investigations. Oh, okay. So if an employee backs up or is accused of doing something that's not right, they'll sometimes ask me to come in and look at it. And quite often I'll get asked to go to Winnipeg or one of the jails back there because I don't know anybody back there. I don't have a connection personally to anybody. So I can write an unbiased report. They've always treated me well in Winnipeg. But um, sometimes out here, I was doing a fact-finding once, I remember, and there was nothing to it. It was, a fact-finding is not a disciplinary, it's just basically, is there any truth to this? And I couldn't find any truth to it. I did a bunch of interviews. It seemed like somebody was just making stuff up, making some accusations. I couldn't substantiate them. So I wrote my report, wrapped it up. Two months later, they wanted me to go back and re-interview certain people, and they named the people. And I went back and re-interviewed them, and I still didn't have any evidence of any sort of substantial thing, but I know yeah. they were trying to get me to find dirt because they wanted to get rid of somebody. Uh, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> and I wasn't going to allow myself to do that. I'm not going to go in and make stuff up about a person just to help them get rid of them. Yeah. yeah exactly. you know, tell it like it is. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> How concerned would your um, ATV for, for elections, like, you know, this, this election we just had, mm. although there's still some issue about the results. Yeah. Well, our new president, Walter Bonneau, sent a really good letter to all the Métis citizens in the province and encouraged them to vote. And uh, he didn't, um, he didn't endorse anybody, mm -hmm. but he basically said, you know, we've had our issues with the current government, um, but we've also have had issues with previous governments. Mm -hmm. So get out there and vote the way you want to yeah. see the province. Yeah. And I thought it was a really good letter. I hope it encouraged people to get out and vote. That's kind of the position we take. We think provincially, the, unless it was very egregious, they probably wouldn't endorse. Uh, well, that's a the party. best way. I agree with you. You know, I, I watch like sometimes, you know, with the American. Mm -hmm. What's the view? And that's the same thing. Like they say, people get out and vote. We're not telling you who to you, you, But think about it. Mm -hmm. you know, well, right now, it's ridiculous who they have mm -hmm. running, you know? You want an honest person or you want a guy who, who just says whatever he wants and wants to be a dictator? <laughs> yeah. It's pretty obvious, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they don't say, I can't tell you who to vote for. I shouldn't tell you who to vote for. Mm -hmm. You vote your conscience. Yeah. That's the way it should be for everybody. Yeah, I agree. Right? Yeah. I'm always kind of amazed though at uh, um, like why people don't want to, like we have um, conservatives, the liberals, the NDP, and the Green Party. Yeah. And some people I know won't vote for the Green Party because they say, well, they're not going to win anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, to me, that's a ridiculous statement. Like, how can anybody win? And why do you keep going? I guess it's like back and forth with the three parties. Mm -hmm. What changes? So, you know, I, ha I had, um, what's his name? He was representing the Green Party. Mm -hmm. I had him on the show. But I say, let's just say the liberals are in. So the liberals will do something, whether we like it or not, with our money. It could change. They don't win the next time around. So this, this, so it's now maybe it's the conservatives that they're gonna undo what the liberals had done. You know, but we don't get our money back. You know, and it's like this stuff. Why do you keep voting for that same type of thing? Like yeah. My mind, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, you know what? That's partly because of our stupid first past the post system. I think if we had proportional representation, mm -hmm. and they, they always scare our fear mongers when we have these uh, votes on it, changing our electoral system. But it's the lobbyists all the time that don't like they don't like proportional representation because they don't know who to lobby. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so because you you don't know who's going to hold the balance of power all the time, so they'll they'll fear monger and they'll say things like, "Oh, you're going to get a a far right government controlling things," and, and it's like, "Well, we already kind of have that in, you know, in the U.S." Like, <laughs> and and that's first past the post, right? So it can happen under any system, but I just feel like proportional representation would be uh, almost like a tonic for the polarization we're seeing in the world politically that because you could vote for your green party and, and I could vote whoever I want to vote and, and whoever wins wins and, and I could I like the rank ordered ballot so I could say okay I like Dan first I like this person second I like this yeah, person exactly. third and yeah. then the first person to get past fifty percent is the one that wins the seat. So you you have to court not just your hardcore supporters, but you also have to court people who might be leaning the other way yeah. and convince them that you're a good second choice. Right. So one of the issues I have sometimes have is like I might like the party but not maybe the person running. Mm -hmm. You know, as head of that party. Mm -hmm. Darn it, you know? Yeah. My dad said that the other day. He said that he's always just voted for the person. So, he, and he lives in the North Island, right? Mm -hmm. So he knows all the people right. personally, oh, okay. and he knows what they bring to the table. And so he's voted probably for every party at any given time right. uh, throughout his lifetime. Because he's like, oh, I know that candidate. Oh, they're running for progressive conservatives back then. I remember um, this is back in the uh, Mulroney days, and he liked the progressive conservative candidate for our riding, so that's where his leanings were. But then later on, he uh, liked the NDP lady, Claire Trevena, and so he supported her. Right. So and that's kind of the way I'm going these days. Is yeah. Less about the party and saying, oh no, we can't have this one, but it's, I want to know that the person is a hard worker. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. I felt like Dan was a hard worker. That's why I supported him. Right. You know. I wish we could, like, I, I, for me, I'd like to see also more. Don't make decisions for, for us behind closed doors. Mm. That drives me insane. Yeah. You know, I don't want to find out after the fact, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's some city consultation going on right now about the future of what this town might look like. Is that right? I'll send you the link to it, but I saw it on Reddit, and I'm going to weigh in on it. Mm -hmm. I want to know what you want to see in the future for Chilliwack and what you don't want to see. Okay. Do you have any examples you know? Do you well, remember? One thing I'm going to mention is I don't want to see corporate landlords buying up these buildings like Main Street. I'm fine with corporations owning maybe a building. I actually don't think they should even own a building, but if they are going to own a building, they shouldn't be allowed to just buy up a whole bunch of them. Because then they can kind of, you know, pump the rent up. Absolutely. People don't have a choice. Absolutely. So there should be uh, consideration for bylaws that say a corporation can only own a maximum of X number of units in our community. And then another corporation will have to come in and, I guess, buy the other ones. But preferably, none of them will be owned by corporations. Yeah, <laughs> so. we have a little bit of competition price-wise. Yeah. We shouldn't have, I don't like foreign, foreign by owners either. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Who don't live here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you're just basically an investment to them. Pay their bills. They don't have the same kind of concern, you know, as somebody who actually lives here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've seen that a few times in this town. I'm so unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Person lives like either not in the community but maybe in the city or in another province even but sometimes they live in another country yes and then the house gets into uh, almost derelict based on the renters in there and also they, about it. yeah and also they don't understand how is the canadian laws mm -hmm. you know like a friend of mine um, needed a, um, a service dog mm -hmm. as a renter oh no you're not allowed 
absolutely allowed, but she, the person, yeah. it wasn't the owner that told her that, it's just somebody representing the owner, right? Yeah, property like, management. Company yeah, or well, the owner doesn't know, the property manager should know, mm -hmm. right? But uh, she had to force the issue, and I told her, you absolutely have that right. Nobody can stop you from having a service animal. Yeah. That's just the way it is. That's the law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my cat should be considered a service animal. Why not? It brings my anxiety down. Well, support. That would be mm -hmm. emotional support. Mm -hmm. And in our building, we're in no pet building, but we have somebody who has an emotional support dog. Okay. You know, and then I think that's perfectly legit in my opinion. Mm -hmm. All right. I would even like to see them change that to, you know, a lot of people have a small cat. We have one person apparently who's highly allergic. Well, we ran through that in the, in the institution, in the prison, yeah, my own institution. When I started there in 2001, um, they had cats. And we were building new units there. Mm -hmm. We had one older unit, the 90-person unit. Then they were building these 120-person units. And they decided they weren't going to allow cats in those ones because you get staff with allergies. Right. You don't have to work in that for 12 yeah. hours. And you also have inmates with allergies. Uh, so, But we also didn't want to get rid of the cats because they were very attached to a lot of the sure. long-time residents there. And um, so I think only that one older unit is allowed to have cats. Oh. So, I mean, I think in a building like yours, you could say, well, they, they, keep, they have their own self-contained suite, no animals in there. It's not like they're going to all of a sudden uh, break out hives or something. Into well, I agree. <laughs> So you said there was an elder abuse situation. Oh my gosh. Probably can't talk about it on your show. Actually, why not? Well, I don't know. I mean, well, I wouldn't mention person being that's all. But the person that was in, the elder involved, she finally figured it out for herself. I'm so glad because I was so concerned. I was letting everybody know that there's just these red flags with this woman. Mm -hmm. Okay? I even told the woman herself. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I don't like you. And I think you're not what you're doing. So, you know, I said, there's red flags everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. um, she was really this elder, my older woman, is a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. It's a very a bad emotional situation. Mm -hmm. You know, some has some loss. Yeah, very unfortunate. But she lost her youngest son recently, mm -hmm. and so this woman was supposed to be a friend of her son's. My friend didn't know this woman before, mm -hmm. sort of moved in to help. Well, it wasn't first she wasn't so even in. She was just there to help her out, you know, a little bit. And then next thing you know, she's there more and more. Next thing you know, she brings her dog. And oh yeah. On and on and on. And now she's got the person's um, my friend's uh, debit card. And oh no. Yeah, a lot of red flags there. And, oh, and it just got worse and worse. So I guess my friend finally realized. What she said she whispered it to me. They had gone away on while well, her apartment was being worked on, it. and she went to come back, to come to my door because I have a key, you know, to get in there. Mm -hmm. Um, she whispered to me that she wasn't happy that the person had been so bossy to her. Mm -hmm. And when you try to phone her, that person would always answer the phone. Or oh, yeah. if my friend would phone, would my friend answer in the background, she's always yapping, you know, telling her what to say. And it, oh my God, it's just horrendous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely horrendous. That's sad when that happens. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping they're gonna press charges. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe they're stealing money. You never know, right? She's supposed to be a caregiver. Mm -hmm. I, I said, "Where's your uh, criminal check?" Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I have it. I have it. You know, I'll show it. Show it to me. Mm -hmm. Her son, the woman's son, asked to see it. But the woman's son doesn't live here. He never saw a copy. Mm -hmm. And this other person, she's also moving in another person to help out. Like when she has to go home, she bring in somebody. None of them had criminal had their criminal check mm -hmm. done. You know, mm -hmm. and so her excuse was, "Well, I don't want my, your friend to pay for it. Why would she have to pay for it? That's your place, wonderful. You're bringing these people in. I wouldn't even let her in my door. <laughs> like when she came to my place for anything, I said, you can wait in the hallway. Because <laughs> I just, just because to let her know that you're just a con. Yeah. A real con artist. You get a vibe, right? Uh, I get a real 
I've been wrong a few times. Oh, yeah, I'm but, wrong. Yeah. But um, most of the time, I can take people pretty quickly, and uh, I can tell the ones that are. You know, they make me feel greasy. Then I know that there's something going on. So then I start to go, okay, why am I feeling this? And I see the the red flags, right? I couldn't even look at this woman hardly because mm -hmm. what I saw, it was like all this blackness and stuff come out from inside mm -hmm. her. You know, mm -hmm. that's what I saw. Not 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 visually, but yeah. inside, right? Yeah. And I just knew she just wasn't good. And then it happened with some. So my friend Jane had her locks changed so she couldn't get into it because um, there was a lock, there was a door that was out from the outside. Yeah. She could have gotten in from the outside, couldn't get into the building without being busted, but yeah. she couldn't get into my friend's place unit from the outside, so those locks were changed. Then she had the fob, still had the fob to get into the garage. She didn't want to return it. Um, she wants to get more money, whatever, you know, blah, blah, I don't know about that part. But anyway, so... Uh, our president, I deactivated the farm so she couldn't get in. Oh, that's good. Right. But it's all this stuff that you've been fired. She has been fired. This mm -hmm. time she was fired. She's so, so angry about being fired. But she's apparently, on, she knows me on Facebook. Okay. Okay, that's why I posted that. Mm -hmm. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. Her. Mm -hmm. Like, don't push it. Otherwise, I won't say anybody's name unless I yeah. have to, right? Send it to me privately so I can keep an eye out. <laughs> Make sure they don't target a Métis senior or something. Oh, God. But she would. She would just mm -hmm. target anybody. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely do that. This well, is this really been good. a long conversation. And yeah, and I'm spilling my food. So, uh, it's good. It's a really good food. It is good food. So I think we'll end it here, the yeah. interview. Well, I don't know how long it was, but we'll find out. So everybody, thank you so much for watching the show. We hope you continue to do so. You know, and I want to do more of this type of thing. It's fun. Come to the E.E.R. Oh, if you yeah. haven't been to E.E.R., come here. It's, <laughs> it's on Wellington. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, thanks, everybody. Take care, man. Can't see my heart when I'm doing this. Peace out. <laughs> thanks, Peter. It was great having you nice. back on the show.